morning, church family. It is good to be in worship this morning with you. Last week, we celebrated Pentecost Sunday, and Pentecost is, is a celebration of the coming of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that binds us together as a family of God. Paul says in Romans that if the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we're children of God, then we're brothers and sisters with each other. So as the family, uh, we want to be a countercultural family. We want to be a countercultural family in a, in a culture where relationships have been dismissed and devalued. We want to be a countercultural family where we lift up relationships, we know each other, we care for each other. That's what we're about here at the Carroll First United Methodist Church. Welcome to everyone in the sanctuary and welcome to everyone online. Glad that you're able to join us this morning uh, through technology. You're just as, part of, as much a part of this worship service as those of us who are in the building. Toward that end of being community, uh, it's good to know each other's names. If you want to be part of the same family, good to know each other's names. Name tags help. Okay, that's a hint. I'm just going to say that. Name tags help. Uh, introducing yourself to folks you might not know very well. Grab a cup of coffee in back and stand in the midst with somebody you don't know. Just to spend five minutes getting to know someone. Those kinds of things would be great. We also would love to have a new snapshot of your family to put in the directory so that people, we can look at the directory and people can sort out who's who. And uh, if you'd fill out the connect card, that's the other thing. Fill out the connect card in your bulletin or online and we will use that to care for, uh, for you as the best that we can. This morning, uh, we were going to have Larry and Jane Keys from Africa University in Zimbabwe. They're not able to be here because uh, they came down with COVID. Uh, they, did, they did to me what I did to you guys on Confirmation Sunday. Uh, and on 3 o'clock Friday afternoon, uh, I find out that, that uh, you know, they're not able to be here because they have, have COVID. And all the plans for the Sunday kind of suddenly went down the drain. There's a big blank spot in Sunday's worship service, and in case you don't know it, sermons don't just fall out of the sky. Uh, so I'm kind of scrambling to figure out what we're going to do today. Uh, it seemed like kind of a disaster to me. You know, it just seemed like everything had fallen apart. The skies got dark, and and it just seemed like a disastrous few minutes, at least, until I figured out what was going on. And Susie offered our VBS program, videos, and and that was the beginning of an idea of how this service might be turned around. And you know, the theme of Friday's Vacation Bible School, is God is a surprising God. Three, three o'clock phone call was a surprising phone call, but even more surprising is the way God turns around those dark times into light times, turns around those disasters into times of opportunity for the gospel to be, to be preached. So as we focus on the story of Joseph during Vacation Bible School, uh, we're going to focus on the story of Joseph today. We're going to get to watch the, the videos from Vacation Bible School. We're going to talk about uh, the story. We're going to talk about a little different part of the story than the, than the kids did. One of my favorite lines from Joseph is, you intended it, he was told his brothers, you intended it for harm, but God intended it for good. Sometimes things come to us that it seems like they harm us. seems like they're going to harm us. It seems like a disaster, but God turns them around and makes them something Good. So I hope that what God does in today's service will help turn you around out of whatever dark place you might have in your life, will help you to see that something good can come from that darkness, and will help you see that God is present with you even in that darkness. Let's prepare for worship as we listen to the prelude this morning.
If you're able, would you rise and for the call to worship in the opening song? Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go. Lord of hosts, you have sent us. We have said we'll go. Please give us the courage to stand for you, to break the chains of injustice, to proclaim your good news. It is Vacation Bible School. What a wonderful week we had in Vacation Bible School. Some of you were, were here, uh, were important parts of, of that. Uh, and uh, uh, I have some numbers for you, just so that those of you who weren't here can have an idea of what it was like. Um, we had 78 kids, which is really good. Uh, not a record, but it's really good for post-COVID numbers. Uh, we were extremely uh, pleased. 31 kids from our church, 31 kids from other, oh, excuse me, 31 kids that had no church at all. 31 kids from our church, 31 kids that had no church at all, and 16 kids from other churches in the community, including St. John, St. Paul, St. Saint, Saint Joseph, uh, Renew, St. Lawrence, and Carol First, uh, which would be the Assembly of God over here. Uh, so when I hear Carol First, that's not the one I, what I think of first. But uh, what a wonderful gift it was to have all those children there. With 78 children, uh, guess how many helpers you need? A lot? A lot? She had 47 helpers here, which is amazing. Those of us who work with volunteers uh, have, been, have been moaning the last several months since COVID that volunteers are hard to find. It's hard to get people to, to commit. And uh, Susie did a wonderful job co collecting a group of volunteers uh, that just served faithfully. And we give thanks for each and every one of those volunteers because they're the ones that made Vacation Bible School work. Those volunteers uh, ranged, ranged in age from, from quite senior to uh, some of our sixth graders were volunteers in Vacation Bible School. And we give thanks for all of them. Their offering this week went to the food pantry. They did an interesting thing. They went to the community garden. Clay and Carol took them out to the community gardens where they planted corn and beans and they harvested radishes and lettuce. Thank you. Radishes and lettuce. And then they took the harvest into the, the food pantry down here on, on Main Street and learned about the food pantry. What a wonderful idea, a uh, way to connect what they're doing with the way it helps people uh, and, uh, and, and we had enough good days this week that we were able to actually do all of that. All the kids were, who were, were going to go out were able to go out. What a wonderful thing that was. Thank you, Clay and Carol, for, for helping with, with that idea. Uh, in addition, they brought in 127 food items. And they brought in $302.92. For a total, by time um, we've, someone paid for the plots, uh, there was a donation, a $1,000 donation to the, to the food bank. Uh, by the time all that's added together, $1,427.92 plus the 127 food items, plus the lettuce, plus the radishes, plus their time. So uh, add that all up, and you've got a really nice offering from the, from the kids and from the volunteers at Vacation Bible School. I've been in prayer. Uh, she was actually at Vacation Bible School on Friday to see the, to see the girls spin the wheel of yuck. And... Um, She's, she's doing okay. Uh, it's been a really, really hard journey, the, the treatments. Uh, they have a lot of treatments left, it sounds like, from what Jeff said on, on Friday. Uh, so keep them in prayer. Uh, the girls had a great time at Vacation Bible School and did a wonderful job, so we're grateful for, for that opportunity for them to be part of us. Uh, we do want to lift up Amy and the whole family. Uh, any, anything we need to add to that, Barb? We have waiting time, but they want to thank everyone for, for all, that they've, all that you've done. Um, I don't know how the meal train sign-up is doing right now. If you haven't checked that out lately, check out the meal train sign-up. Uh, Sherry in the office can give you details about that if you don't know how to get there. Uh, it's a sign, something you sign up online for, and you can take food in three days a week. Uh, anything you do, they're grateful for. So just remember them. There were, and you're going to get tired of hearing this, but we need to, we need to remember it. Uh, it'll show up in the prayer this morning. Uh, Fifteen more mass shootings this week. How many did you hear about on the news? Not many. Fifteen more mass shootings, 19 deaths, 57 wounded. 
keep people in Ames and around the Cornerstone Church in our thoughts and prayers. Um, but it's an, it's an ongoing issue in our culture, and I don't know why I just feel compelled to, to keep bringing that up for us because we need to work on that. Uh, God needs to work on, on that. If there's nothing else, would you allow me to lead you in the pastoral prayer? The beauty of nature, the people who've taught us kindness and moral values, and we pray, hallowed be your name. We pray for your vision of our world to be fully realized. There are so many barriers to that vision, like our insecure selves, afraid to love or be loved, wounded people who hate more than they love, who judge more than they forgive, nations and leaders scrambling for superiority, leaders and neighbors and friends who disappoint and confuse. And so we pray, O oh God, for your love to overwhelm all of that. Keep us f- part of your kingdom. Keep a- make us part of your kingdom so that we may share your love and your grace in these dark places in our world. We pray that in your love, your kingdom will come and your will will be done in this place. Be with those whose loved ones have been killed and wounded families who have been impacted by mass shootings this week. We pray for the families of the 19 who died and the 57 who were wounded. We're ashamed. We're afraid. We're confused. We are heartbroken. We pray for families around the world and in our own community who grieve. We lift up those who pray for healing. We pray for our earth that you would move your people and those who wait in fear to turn to you, to turn our lives to see the wondrous beauty of your creation and to see the rhythms and cycles that you've placed around us. Lord, help us to feed the hungry. Most of all, help us to share what you've given us, both material and spiritual. We pray for our own children who are here at Vacation Bible School this week, children in the community and children around the world. May they know love and acceptance as they grow in your grace. We thank you for parents struggling to raise these children in a frightening world. We pray for our church that you would continue leading us into our unknown future, moving us to seek your vision. We thank you for the many ways the many servants who know your love and share it with others. We thank you too for longtime members who offer a legacy of wisdom and welcome. Forgive us our many debts, dear God. How we forget to love you with our whole selves. We, we forget to love one another as you've loved us. Many pressures tempt us to turn away, but we ask that you keep us headed in your direction. Keep leading us toward you and your Son, Jesus Christ, our brother, our teacher, and our Savior. We pray all of this in his name, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As you mentioned, um, the story of Joseph is what the VBS kids did during this week. Um, So during the videos that Pastor's going to share during his sermon, you'll see the whole first part of the story. And I pick up here today at the end of the story where famine Uh, has now gone through the land of Canaan, not just Egypt, and the brothers have come to um, Egypt to to buy food. And I see that we have switched from 2 Corinthians to Genesis, so it is on the screen. When Joseph learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at one another? I have heard, he said, that there is grain in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. 
So 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Gen Benjamin with the, his brothers, for he feared that harm might come to him. Thus the sons of Israel were among the other people who came to buy grain, for the famine had reached the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor of all the land. It was he who sold to all the people of the land, and Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him and their fa with their faces to the ground. When J Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he said. And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. Although Joseph had recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Joseph also remembered the dreams that he had dreamed about them, and he said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. They said to him, No, my lord. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. And then we're going to transition um, to chapter 45. So... And there's just a little bit here in between. So Joseph then questioned his brothers about their family and learned that his father Jacob and his younger brother Benjamin were alive, but he wanted to test their character. So they put, he put them in custody for three days, and then he kept one brother, Simeon, in prison and sent the rest home um, with their grain, and he ordered that they, before they could return, they had to bring their youngest brother with them. He also instructed his steward to put the money the, boy, the brothers had used to buy grain into their grain sacks. So when the brothers returned home, they told Jacob all that had happened in Egypt, and Jacob refused to send John Benjamin. But the famine became so severe, he finally relented when Judah promised the safety of Benjamin. When the brothers returned to Egypt, uh, Joseph had his steward take Simeon from uh, prison and take all the brothers to his own home. The brothers were afraid this was about the money that was in their sacks. But when Joseph returned at noon, they had a noon meal together. Benjamin was given five times as much as the others. Then before they returned home, Joseph gave his steward the instructions again to put the money in the money in the grain sacks and put his silver cup in Benjamin's sack. And after they had started their journey, he sent the steward after them. When the steward accused them of stealing, they were so surprised they professed that the person who took the silver cup would die. Of course, it was found in Benjamin's sack. And the steward said, no, just the one who stole the cup will become a slave. The rest of you go on home. And so they return to Joseph's house. This is where we pick up the story. Uh, oh, excuse me. When they return to Joseph's house, Judah is the one that stepped forward and, and begged to be the slave instead of, ben, uh, instead of Benjamin. So when Judah stepped forward like this, we pick up the story in chapter 45. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those that stood by him, and he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one had stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But the brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. And then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to keep you alive and many survivors. 
the word of the Lord. We all face challenges in our lives. We all face uh, struggles. We all face times when, when we feel like, where are we going to turn? We feel like everyone's abandoned us. We feel like, we feel like we're alone. We feel like, like there's just no answer and the, and the skies turn dark and, and we don't know what our next step is. We feel forgotten. We feel abandoned by everyone and everything, sometimes even God. Have you ever been there? We've probably all been to that place where we feel forgotten even by God. But the light shines in the most unexpected ways. God's light shines in the most unexpected ways because God is a surprising God. That was Friday's theme at Vacation Bible School. God is a surprising God. Maybe the most surprising story in God's story is Easter. And we've got Good Friday, Jesus is on the cross, he's dying, he's, he finally speaks his last words, and he dies, and the Apostles' Creed says he was crucified, dead, and buried. How many times can you say he died, right? He died. What worst thing could we possibly do besides killing God? The skies grew dark. People's lives were were thrown into chaos the disciples when they when they thought that the people had killed God what in the world were they going to do but then after Saturday on Sunday morning the women come running back to the disciples crying he's risen he's risen he's risen the good news is that God's power overcame death God's power over light overcame darkness God's love overcame the hate And that's the way God does things. God takes those bad situations. He doesn't give us the bad situations. You have to be clear about that. God does not give us the bad situations, but takes those bad situations and sometimes is able to turn them around and do something surprising with them. We have a story today that the children studied in vacation Bible school that's full of surprises. It's full of twists and turns. Joseph was Jacob's first uh, youngest son and he was the favorite and he received that that wonderful coat of many colors you've probably seen joseph in the technicolor dream coat the the old old movie old play Uh, he's the one that received that that technicolor dream coat and he was the favorite and he he told stories to to his brothers about how they were going to bow down to him and well you know what let's let the kids tell the story In today's monumental Bible story, we journeyed with Joseph and found out about his family. Joseph had a big family. He was one of 12 brothers. But sometimes Joseph and his brothers didn't get along. For one thing, Joseph was his dad's favorite. His dad even gave him a beautiful robe. And Joseph liked to tell his dad every time his brothers did something wrong. Joseph's brothers already didn't like him, but then he started bragging about his dreams. In one dream, Joseph said his brothers' bundles of grain all bowed to his bundle of grain. In another dream, Joseph said the sun, moon, and eleven stars bowed down before him. The sun, moon, and eleven stars meant Joseph's parents and brothers. One day, Joseph's dad sent him to check on his brothers, who were taking care of sheep. Joseph's brothers saw him coming and made a plan to kill him. One brother spoke up and thought maybe they should just put Joseph in a big pit. That brother planned to rescue Joseph later. The brothers tore Joseph's robe and threw him into the big pit. Then some men came along with silver and other things to trade. And Joseph's brothers decided to trade him for silver. That was a really horrible thing to do. The brother who had stood up for Joseph went to the pit to rescue him. But Joseph was gone. The brothers decided to tell their dad Joseph had died. Joseph's dad was very sad. Things looked pretty bad for Joseph, 
But God was still there. And no matter what happened to Joseph, God loved him. And God loves you no matter what. In today's Totally True Bible Story, Joseph's story continues in Egypt. Joseph worked as a slave for a guy named Potiphar. That means Joseph lost his freedom and was owned by someone else. That's a really bad thing. Maybe Joseph did a little sweeping. Maybe he planted some seeds. Maybe he let the cows out of the barn. Even though what happened to Joseph was wrong, God was with Joseph, and Potiphar could see that. So Potiphar put Joseph in charge of everything he owned. God was with Joseph as he served, and God helped him. But then one day, Potiphar's wife told a lie about Joseph, and Joseph got sent to prison for something he didn't do. Even in prison, God was with Joseph. The prison warden thought Joseph was pretty cool. The warden put Joseph in charge of the people in the prison. Joseph knew that God was right with him, no matter where he went. Joseph met a cupbearer and a baker who were in prison with him. One night, the cupbearer and the baker both had strange dreams. They asked Joseph to tell them what the dreams meant. In the cupbearer's dream, he saw a grapevine, and he squeezed some grape juice into Pharaoh's cup. That dream meant that in three days, the cupbearer would get out of prison and get his job back. In the baker's dream, he carried three baskets of food on his head, but the birds ate the food. Joseph said the baker's dream meant the baker would die in three days. God was with Joseph when he was a servant, when he was in prison, and when he explained dreams. God was with Joseph everywhere. God is with you everywhere, too. No matter where you go, God is there to help you. In today's totally true Bible story, things started to turn around for Joseph. It all started with a strange night for Pharaoh, the guy who's in charge of Egypt. Pharaoh was sound asleep in bed, when all of a sudden he started dreaming about cows. There were seven healthy cows eating grass, but then seven skinny unhealthy cows came and ate them up. Next, there were seven delicious-looking stalks of grain, and then seven more stalks of grain that shriveled up and ruined the first seven stalks of grain. Well, Pharaoh was troubled by these dreams. What could they mean? Then Pharaoh heard about Joseph, a guy who was really good at figuring out what dreams meant. But Joseph was stuck in prison, so Pharaoh called Joseph to the palace. After listening to Pharaoh's dreams, Joseph listened to God, and God helped Joseph know what the dreams meant. Joseph knew the seven healthy cows and the seven delicious heads of grain meant that for the next seven years, Egypt would have lots of food. But the seven skinny cows and the seven withering grains meant that after that, there would be seven years with no food. God said they needed to save extra food for the next seven years, but Pharaoh needed someone to collect all the extra food. So he gave Joseph this important job. Joseph was put in charge of storing food because God was in charge of Joseph's life. God is in charge, so don't worry about anything.
Today's true Bible story started out sad. Jesus, God's very own son, was on trial. But he hadn't done anything wrong. Even Pilate, the guy running the trial, didn't think Jesus had done anything wrong. But Pilate let the crowd decide, and the crowd demanded that Jesus die. So they led Jesus away to be killed. Jesus hung on a cross until he died. Then some friends came and asked if they could bury Jesus' body by putting it in a tomb. Soldiers sealed the tomb with a huge, heavy stone. But that's when this true story turned really, really happy. Three days later, some women went to Jesus' tomb to put some spices there. The stone was moved. And the tomb was empty. Jesus' body, gone. Angels told the women that Jesus wasn't there anymore because he's alive. The women ran to tell Jesus' other friends the good news. Jesus died for our sins, and then he showed how he's even stronger than death. God is stronger than anything. The, the fifth day, they don't have the, the, the other video ready, so we're going to do the song, but it's taking longer than I thought, so we're going to go ahead and continue the stories this morning. Uh, surprising God, turning things around, the story of Jesus coming out of the grave, surprising story, the story of Joseph uh, being thrown in the pit, becoming a, a slave, and then becoming a a leader in the house of Pharaoh and, or in the house of Potiphar and then being thrown into jail again and coming out of jail and becoming a leader in, in Egypt. It's a story of turnarounds. It's not a story of coincidences. Okay? Not a story of coincidences. It's a story of God redeeming the bad things that happen in our lives sometime. I want to tell two stories about uh, real life stories of redemption. I remember one a woman in one of our first churches here in Iowa, Robin and I were co-pastoring at the Geneseo and Garrison churches, and I don't remember how I connected with this woman, but for some reason I started visiting a woman who had a, a really serious case of cancer and it, things did not look really good for her. And I visited her for a while and realized that she, she had a faith in Jesus, she believed in God, she had never been baptized, and that became important to her as we visited. She also told me that her children and grandchildren had not been baptized. And as we, as we visited and I got to know them, it became very important to her that before she died, that she, she helped them to come to Christ and be baptized as well. Before she became uh, seriously ill, because in, in those days, uh, the treatments were almost as bad as the disease in the late 80s, uh, and before she became seriously ill and was unable to come to church, she, uh, uh, we arranged a Sunday. And she came in her wheelchair and her, her nine children and grandchildren came. She was in her wheelchair at the end of her life, and the youngest was not walking yet. And we baptized all nine of them, one after another, that day. One of the great memories of ministry. After her funeral, the daughter, the oldest daughter, and I were visiting, and, and she was talking about how important this was to her and, and what, how, what a difference it made that we had done that together, that we had, been, that we had baptized them together, that they, they had been baptized with their mother, and that she didn't think she'd be able to have gotten through the, the death, her, her mother's death, uh, which was a very, very difficult and ugly death. Uh, she wasn't sure she'd be able to get through that without this baptism and knowing Jesus. What a difference that makes. It might seem like it's just a request of a dying lady, but it's not. It's an act of God because God is a surprising God, not knowing what was going to happen in these people's lives. Uh, God knew, and God took care of them in this special way. Uh, what a surprising God we have. Robin has a story. I was thinking about stories in our lives, and I thought of one. It was really more Robin's story than mine, so I asked her to tell that story.
So God is indeed full of surprises and uh, has a way of taking what others might have meant for harm and turning it around for good. When we moved to Carroll, um, I accepted an appointment to a church and on paper, it looked like a match made in heaven. Unfortunately, it wasn't. Um, it just didn't work out that way. And when I left there in December of 2019, I was full of self-doubt. Uh, my self-esteem had been pretty much battered and I was pretty much wondering if I had actually been crazy because I couldn't figure out what was true and what wasn't true anymore. Um, so in January of 2020, I was home uh, trying to discern where the next steps would take me. And I got a phone call from a, a friend um, and professional acquaintance uh, who worked as a chaplain for St. Croix Hospice. And she said that St. Croix had a job opening for a chaplain and that it was for a new office that was opening in Denison. And I laughed out loud because uh, Denison is probably the last place I would have chosen to go. Uh, yes, God has a very strange sense of humor sometimes. Um, Denison is the town where I lived for um, four years uh, while I went through high school and I graduated from high school in Denison. Uh, but my parents' marriage um, kind of went super critical during that time. And so Denison for me is a place of bad memories and um, embarrassment over the events that led to my parents' divorce. And I, for 40 years, I had walked around absolutely sure that every classmate and, and all these other people that I know in Denison knew all about my parents' divorce and how it came to be. What I found when I started working in Denison was not that at all. Um, former neighbors and classmates were welcoming of me. Um, early on, I had the opportunity to preach at the church where my dad had been a pastor literally standing in his footprints um, at the pulpit and before the altar. And you know what? It was okay. Um, it was okay. Uh, people would ask me about my siblings. You know, where are they? What are they doing now? They, they were really interested and caring about that. Friends of my parents, uh, I found their names on the doors um, at Eventide when I was there visiting hospice patients and I was able to reconnect with some of them. And then just the physical beauty of the town of Denison uh, was really a joy to me and um, it was kind of soothing to me. And the sunsets, uh, I don't know why, but the sunsets in Denison seem quite beautiful. When, when I lived there, uh, we lived on top of a hill and every night as I walked home from school in the winter time when the sun would be setting early, it would be so spectacular. I just loved it. It never ceased to raise my spirits. Um, and so that was uh, a, a joy to me too. What I found was that I was creating new memories of Denison and those old memories were fading away. I was really experiencing a great deal of healing uh, working in the Denison community. Uh, I had new relationships uh, with co-workers and, and I guess renewed relationships in a lot of ways. And most of all, um, God's good uh, has shown through in my ministry with uh, dying and hospice patients. Patients with whom I have just shared such special relationships um, I've never considered myself uh, much of an evangelist. I don't think evangelism is my strongest spiritual gift. Um, but somehow, just um, with no plan or intention on my part, um, the Holy Spirit has just paved the way for me to literally uh, bring a, a couple of people 
um, into, into God's grace and into the family of God. Um, and then there's my faithful five, a group of residents at one facility where I teach a Bible study every other week. And that's a lot of fun and, and really a special group. And then there is the patient who became uh, a very cherished friend to me. When you have a patient for almost two years, um, and when you're about the same age, uh, it can really um, just naturally lead to, to a true friendship. And um, my friend meant a great deal to me, and I have no regrets about, uh, about that friendship. Um, and uh, at this time, I'm grieving her death, which was just um, a few days ago. Uh, but God blessed me so much uh, with her friendship, so I am grateful to that. So things did not work out at all the way I expected. Uh, if you take everything I've shared and add into that the mix of COVID and being furloughed for three months, uh, suffice it to say it hasn't really been very easy, but it has been very good, and that was God's intention all along. Thank you. God is a surprising God. Life is full of twists and turns, and God is around every corner. Remember, God is a surprising God. Whatever you may be going through, God may have a surprise around your next corner. Amen. The grace of God go with you. The surprises of God, may they surprise you. And may the grace of God lead you around every corner. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.